Hi, it's Fraser here. If you're a regular listener to this podcast or a regular reader of Spiked, I hope you'll agree that Spiked's message is more necessary than ever. Spiked's content is free and it always will be. It's thanks to your donations and regular donations in particular that we've been able to keep going and growing. By donating to Spiked, you're helping us challenge the myriad attacks on free speech and the illiberalism of identity politics. The Spike podcast has now grown to a point where we're able to get sponsorship. What that means for you is that there's another way you can support the show by checking out some of the deals we're able to pass your way. But donations are still by far the best and most direct way to support us. So if you think we're doing something right, saying what needs to be said, challenging what needs to be challenged, then do please consider starting a regular donation if you haven't already. Even £5 per month can go a long way. If you'd like to make a donation, you can do that by going to spikes-online.com and hitting the red donate button in the top right corner. That's spikes-online.com and the red donate button in the top right corner. Now on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Spiked podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and this week we have something rather special for you. Race has become an unavoidable topic in recent months and years. The Black Lives Matter movement in particular has brought race to the fore of politics and our daily lives. We're constantly exhorted to think about race, to talk about race, to recognise our racial privilege or racial oppression. Books like White Fragility and Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race have not only become bestsellers, but are also being taught in schools or used as training materials in the workplace. But as this is the Spiked podcast, we want to question all of that. And to that end, we have two fantastic thinkers who are arguing for the abolition of race entirely. I'm delighted to be joined by Camille Foster, lead producer at Freethink Media and host of the Fifth Column podcast. Camille has described himself as a black man who does not identify as black. Also joining us, we have Inaya Follerin Iman, who is a spiked columnist and founder of the Equiano Project. The Equiano Project promotes freedom, humanism and universalism in opposition to the current climate of racial tribalism and identitarianism. Whiteness is a psychosis. How often have you attempted to give a white person feedback on their inevitable, unaware, racist assumptions or behaviors? How about not focusing on color at all? Pretending that race doesn't matter. This is the ideological equivalent of hiding our heads in the sand. Camille, you've described yourself as a race abolitionist. Now, every uh-huh. right-thinking person wants to oppose racism, but this proposition is a lot more more radical. And can you explain what you mean by this and, and what prompted your thinking? I'm happy to try and explain. Interestingly, I, I think when I first said it, it was a bit tongue-in-cheek. And at the moment, it's just, it's just kind of stuck. And I would love if it caught on. And the basic idea is that I am well aware of the fact that race is a historically freighted concept, biologically, genetically, it is less material than most people imagine it to be. And in most contemporary conversations, uh, I find myself having these exchanges with people where they're invoking race in various contexts, and it just generally tends to mess things up and make it more complicated to have serious conversations about important issues. People's emotions get in the way, they're thinking about all sorts of historical things, And when it comes to self-identification, people use race as this, this way of kind of establishing like these boundaries around groups of people and around framing individuals as members of these particular groups of people with these very obvious and specific characteristics and attributes that they ought to have. And in reality, you know, race is a catch all that generally kind of describes culture and ethnicity and folds them all together in this really sloppy way. And it obscures all the things that make us who we really are. And that is individuals who are members of a lot of different tribes and camps at the same time in this beautifully complicated way. And because I respect that so much in other people, and I would hope people would respect me in the same way, I find no use or value for it, generally speaking, in my personal everyday life. And I have decided to abolish it. 
And I would hope other people would join that campaign because I think it's just a, a better way to interact with one another. In AO, has it been a similar kind of process for you or is there anything in particular that kind of pushed you to take that position? Yeah, I mean, personally, I often prefer to say transcending race rather than abolishing race. I think sometimes abolishing can kind of sound that you can kind of pass some kind of legislation or repeal a law and all of a sudden, you know, race is no longer a significant factor. And I think transcending it can sometimes, it can kind of invite people into a both, I guess, individual and kind of collective realization that this category that we've come to allow to define so much of social relations is actually both relatively recent, quite invented and limiting and stifling. And I think transcending it almost invites us to see beyond the possibilities of having our social life organized racially. But I started questioning the concept of race pretty much in high school. I'd always see myself as a British Nigerian. And I felt that that identity, so to speak, spoke to a historical, cultural, linguistic and migratory uh, identity, which I thought you know was relevant to me. And I felt that race and, and just being black will actually erase many of those complexities. And, and force people into a kind of categorization which put your blackness in opposition or or defined solely in relation mm. to whiteness. And I think that if you yeah, define um, yourself, I guess, really only in relation to white people, then I think that you are setting yourself up for a very kind of adversarial um, relationship, which I think denies our common humanity. I don't think it serves any useful purpose at the moment. It is actually doing a lot of damage and division, viewing ourselves solely through that lens. I did want to ask a bit about that because you say it serves no purpose. I kind of agree with you, but just to push you on that, are there no uses whatsoever? I mean, what about in terms of recognising you know, and tackling racial disparities that might exist in society? I mean, the classic one, Camille, if I could ask you about this, you know, we've been talking about it all year, is the police treatment of African-Americans, you know, the brutal killing of George Floyd, ignited a huge wave of protests. More recently, we've had protests about Jacob Blake being shot several times by the police. Last we're hearing, he's paralysed from the waist down. So, I mean, Camille, do you have anything to say about, first of all, the police specifically, but generally, do we not need to think about, well, racism? You know, is that not a valuable way to talk about society's problems? Yeah. Well, let me take the general first, and then perhaps we could talk a little bit about the specifics with respect to policing. I mean, in a general sense, I don't think not regarding yourself with respect to racial identity and not racing other people requires you to not or makes it impossible for you to acknowledge that racism exists that other people routinely racialize things. In fact, most people routinely racialize things. And that in some instances, you can find people who not only racialize things, but imagine that some race is better than another, or races are inferior in different ways, or even that disparities exist between racial groups, which might have some really complex historical factors that help to reinforce them and, and drive them. We can talk about all of those ideas without imagining ourselves as members of concrete racial identities that are sort of easily um, identifiable. So I don't think there's any contradiction there. What's important, though, and I think policing actually helps to illustrate this, is that recognizing that those disparities exist doesn't necessarily make those disparities go away either, right? Mm. And it doesn't necessarily make those disparities easier to navigate or the problems themselves easier to navigate. If there's a problem with policing in, in the United States, and I would say that there is, the question is, to what degree does race help to illuminate that in a way that makes it easier to understand and explain to people? Is the problem with policing in the United States primarily about like racial disparities? Is it that the police are overkilling black people? Or are there specific things about policing in the United States with respect to how policy works that makes it possible for members of law enforcement to operate in a way that means that they're insufficiently accountable to the people who pay their salaries. Mm. I would say that the latter is definitely true. And I would say that the former is almost certainly less true than people imagine it, if it's true at all. Part of the 
pernicious philosophy of, of racism is the belief that, again, race is a very kind of perennial and immutable category that has distinct characteristics that we can kind of attribute. That is what racism is, and seeing people through that very myopic lens. And I think that part of the idea of abolishing race or transcending race, whatever you want, want to call it, is consistently arguing against instilling race with meaning, whether that is negative attributions or positive ones. And I think part of the um, new development of anti-racism is an attempt to kind of instill race with new meanings. It's often, as I've talked about before, kind of moral superiority and innocence or white fragility or white privilege. This doesn't necessarily illuminate any of the complexities um, that we have been alluding to. And on top of that, um, I would second what Camille said, actually oftentimes race can obscure um, the realities of the situation. For example, we talk about knife crime in black communities in Britain or, or black people being disproportionately affected by COVID-19 or educational attainment. But actually what we find when we dig down to many of those statistics is that there is huge disparities within communities that are racialized as black. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the educational attainment for black African kids is actually much higher than the population at large, whereas that's different for black Caribbean children. So often when we have this very broad racialized category, we could actually end up missing the nuances and complexities of all the different things that are affecting disparities going on. Now is the time to start learning, to become more informed, creative, inspired and relaxed. And you can do this all with The Great Courses Plus. I love this streaming service, especially the app, which allows me to stream courses on all kinds of topics directly from my phone. You can listen to The Great Courses Plus just as you would this podcast. I highly recommend the course An Economic History of the World Since 1400. It'll teach you everything you need to know about how our modern economy came into being. The course covers everything from the Silk Road of the 15th century to 21st century globalisation. With thousands of lectures on almost any topic imaginable, from the depths of the ocean to the history of Egypt to the study of DNA, and new courses are being added all the time, there really is something for everyone. Plus, every course is presented by subject matter experts from top universities and institutions. You're getting in-depth, reliable, fact-based information. And you can watch or listen from your phone or TV with the Great Courses Plus app. You can really use it anywhere in the world. It makes learning so easy and accessible. So make the most of your time. Keep learning with the Great Courses Plus. They're offering listeners to the Spike podcast an amazing deal, an entire month of access for free. This limited time offer won't last. So sign up today at our special URL to get started. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash spiked. Don't wait. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash spiked. I wanted to pick up a little bit on what you said about whiteness and blackness, and it, and it does seem to almost <laughs> be a kind of flip reversal, where blackness now represents innocence, where whiteness would have once represented innocence in a more racist era. And of course, whiteness now represents everything that is evil and bad in the world, and we have to eradicate whiteness. And I, I don't even know what whiteness means, by the way. I, <laughs> it's one of these kind of catch-all terms that can mean anything. I, I once read in the New York Times about a group of Indian boys who are enacting whiteness by being racist, essentially. You kind of struggle with these kind of shifting meanings of, of these words, which goes to your point earlier, you know, about the kind of completely constructed and arbitrary nature of these things. I wanted to touch on one of the most pernicious developments of recent times. Kind of what you're saying is, is very much in line with what Martin Luther King used to say. But now that's a kind of view that is demonized and colorblindness in particular is viewed as a product of, of white supremacy by some quite extreme people. I've heard it said that it's a, a racist microaggression to say, I don't see color. Or if you read Robin DiAngelo's infamous White Fragility, she's very scathing of the white people who, in her view, seize on the words of Martin Luther King to avoid talking about race or at least thinking about it in the way that she wants them to think about. I wonder, Camille, what you made of that kind of development where it's not only that we're actively discouraged from being colorblind, it's it, that very idea is, is, is demonized. It's yeah, no, I've, I've certainly noticed that trend. And I'll say that I, I think it's deeply disturbing and actually quite heartbreaking. I've certainly lived most of my life imagining that the words that 
Dr. King spoke. And it's particular to that. I have a dream speech at the March on Washington, uh, where he said, you know, that, that he hopes for a day when little white girls and black girls can play together. And he hopes for a day when people will judge by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And I think for, for those of us who still hold on to that, what often seems to happen when we're having conversations with people today who have grown, if not skeptical of that, they've at least begun to embrace a, another idea about what a fair society looks like. Their perspective is, well, it's nice for you to hope for that. But given that things haven't been fair historically, that injustices have existed and persisted and have created all these disadvantages, that creates an unlevel playing field. So it's not enough to hope for that meritocratic ideal that, you know, Dr. King is so revered for and is generally associated with. But I, I think that's wrong. I think that's the wrong way to approach it. The imperfectness of our experience, that was always bound to be true. We're always born into different circumstances. We're always, in many respects, sort of trapped by the things that happened to our predecessors that created the circumstances that we actually live under. But that doesn't mean that it isn't the kind of level playing field that we ought to be striving for is one where the law is treating us all equally. And mm. striving for that level playing field puts us in a position that is far better than the situation that most people have faced throughout most of history. And it, again, it doesn't preclude us from being genuinely concerned about the disadvantages that people may face through no fault of their own. And it certainly doesn't prevent us from trying to do anything about that. But it doesn't mean that we have to throw away the meritocratic ideal and to try to erect this Harrison Bergeron-esque universe in which we are pulling people down on account of things that have happened to them that are too advantageous, or then putting people up on boxes because of things that we imagine have happened to them that are disadvantageous. And I, uh... The kind of demonization of colorblindness is a real significant demonstration of the significant departure in terms of uh, the kind of liberal tradition of, of anti-racism that has actually brought about so much progress. And I think it's such a historical amnesia or kind of historical illiteracy to not recognize that it was actually this principle of our common humanity, this kind of humanistic universalist principle that was actually what has ushered in so much of the transformational change that we've seen in the last half century or so. And I would completely, again, echo what Camille said. It's not necessarily a saying that um, this is exactly what can be implemented in very specific prescribed ways right now. It is an ideal. And I think that this is part of what is so flawed about the current identity narrative is that it has no positive vision for the future. It has no real idea of what we can all get behind, something that unifies us all beyond these kinds of very superficial categories. And I think that that is what race abolition and, and race transcendence is trying to do to actually point us to possibilities that can exist beyond this moment. And I think, um, yeah, colorblindness has a really bad PR problem. I think that maybe it's the name mm -hmm. that is unappealing to some people, but it, it's incredibly simple. It's, it's very much being treated equally on under the law, it means that you don't get any preferential or, or differentiatory treatment based off of the color of your skin. How can that be something that we are opposing? And obviously, the, the counter argument would be that, you know, rectifying um, historical disadvantage. But actually, the reality is we have had affirmative action, positive discrimination, as we'll call it in the UK, and all of these quotas. But that has also failed to meaningfully transform the situation for people at the bottom of society as well, because it, it misses individual development. It, it misses kind of economic development. Many of the things that are, are actually what builds people's stake within society and helps them to build intergenerational wealth. So I think that, um, yeah, I think colorblindness is an ideal, but the alternative that is being proposed, I think, is much, much more destructive and pernicious. That is a massive problem. I don't think most people who imagine that, you know, the pendulum was on one extreme before where it was privileging white people and denigrating black people and insisting that blackness was bad, that the pendulum should swing in the complete opposite direction to the other extreme where blackness is lionized and valorized and said to be not just wonderful, but important and the most wonderful thing. Black is king, as Beyonce's latest project, which <laughs> is, is, has a Disney film associated with it, suggests. And whiteness is awful. Like The fact that something terrible happened before doesn't mean that we have to invest this trivial attribute of ourselves 
with all of this profound significance and assure everyone that it is the most important and profound thing about us. Like that is a, it's the same error in a different direction. And the consequences of that could be really profound. And very few people seem to want to tangle with just how nasty those implications might be. Well, I think we should talk a little bit about some of those implications. I mean, you know, to give one example that came up the week we're recording this, NYU has proposed kind of segregated dorm rooms. And, you know, I've noticed that the kind of language used to justify this is reminiscent of the old segregationist. You know, this idea has been around for a while as a kind of anti-racist idea. I read one proponent in the student newspaper at NYU, I think it was 2016, and and they said, it's not a matter of separating race, but separating conflict, which kind of has rings of separation, but equal to me. Mm. How is it that we're kind of, I mean, this is not the only example, right? I mean, there are now black only graduations on a lot of campuses, segregated housing. There's an idea in the UK to have the first ever black only university. Why do people not see that this is repeating a bad thing? How can I not recognize that this is a dark road to go down? I imagine some of the difficulty in in not seeing it is just good intentions. And perhaps that's all of it. And it's hard because we're we're speaking across a, a rather large pond and I don't know much about how it feels there. But I can tell you that I've interacted with a number of people here in the U.S. who feel as though they can't speak openly and honestly about these things. And to the extent they feel discomfort with some of the prevailing winds politically and socially, the things that are happening at their office with respect to diversity and inclusion training that insists that they ought to regard their Black coworkers in a particular way and that when there is a, a disagreement or they're told that they've made someone feel uncomfortable because of something they said, that their intention doesn't matter and that there is not mm. really a conversation to be had, that they need to listen and subordinate themselves. Could be that people feel uncomfortable with a lot of these new things and feel as though they can't speak up, which again, is just, I think that there's a lot of things that are, could be sinister about that. Uh, one thing I will say about the NYU situation, it sounds like it was actually a student group that was proposing that these dorms should be segregated in some way, shape, or form, or at least that there should be Black-only floors of the dormitory. It doesn't sound like NYU is assented to this. And I think it's also important to note that there have been people calling for this sort of thing for years. Mm. And for the most part, personally, I've heard it and it's registered on my radar, but I've always thought to myself, well, it could never be the case that we would ever reach a point where people would actually think that's okay. Like they would understand that we'd, we'd crossed some sort of Rubicon if that begun to happen. But those ideas have attained a level of purchase in American society and perhaps in the UK as well, that makes me deeply uncomfortable. And I think it is far past time for people to set aside whatever discomfort they may feel, whatever concerns they may have about the personal risks to themselves, and to speak out loudly and say, no, that that sounds discriminatory to me, or explicitly, that is discriminatory. I don't think it's right, and I'm not going to stand for it. And do you want to add to that? I'd agree with a lot of that, and particularly in relation to the points about people feeling uncomfortable. I think that part of this is part of a wider kind of societal kind of counter enlightenment movement. You know, I think that this is really just one manifestation of a politics and a culture that has been undermining many kind of foundational Western democratic values, whether that is kind of freedom of speech, the rule of law, innocent until proven guilty. Mm. And now we're seeing with this in relation to the huge enlightenment achievement that kind of all people are created equal. That is a remarkable achievement in an era that was obviously defined by, you know, divine right monarchy and, and all of these types of things. And so I think a lot of this kind of ideology has been part of a wider kind of lack of faith and, and collapse of an authority within Western society where we're unable to confidently defend such foundational notions. So I think, yeah, I think it's um, incredibly worrying and this kind of emergent class, this university class that is now kind of transforming uh, many of our institutions like the cultural media establishment, which is 
bringing forth this very pernicious philosophy that anything that is valuable and good about Western society is part of a kind of white supremacist notion that needs to be destroyed. I mean, I think that you, you guys have talked about it on the podcast before, but like this whole whole idea that like objectivity and keeping time and all of these things are white constructs. So I, I, I think that even if some people are well-meaning, I think it, it is part of a wider idea that everything that is good and valuable about our society um, needs to be destroyed. So I think unless... And I, I would definitely second what Camille said, unless people really recognize the scale and the scope and the depth of what is actually being threatened, then I think that we're very much going to be in the thick of this until we very authoritatively stand up against what is happening and defend the things that we hold true and dear. You're listening to The Spike Podcast. Spiked has no subscriptions and no paywalls. All of our content is free. We rely on the generosity of our listeners and readers to keep us going and growing. For those of you who already donate to Spiked, we can't thank you enough. It really means a lot to the team. If you haven't already, then why not consider giving Spiked a donation? You can make a one-off payment or give monthly by going to spiked-online.com. Freedom of speech is clearly one of the things we'd all agree on in this room at the moment. And, you know, what what do you make of the way that race in particular, I mean, identity politics generally has been exploited to the end of basically attacking people's right to speech. But what do you make of the way race has been weaponized in that particular way? And with the arrival of, I guess, political correctness, which, you know, might have some pros and cons, but now it, it seems to be on completely on steroids where people really feel like they cannot say anything or are censored for saying quite normal things. At least in the UK, I think that the way in which um, the, the kind of cultural media establishment have jumped on this issue has been rather astounding. And what I found, um, and I think you know, many people have talked about this, it's almost been you know used as a weapon to kind of both relieve themselves of whatever kind of real or misplaced guilt they might have, but also to kind of exert moral superiority over the so-called kind of bigoted masses, and a way also to what I would regard stifle and hamper a potential solidarity between people that otherwise would be working collectively together to to forge a, a better society. I mean, many people have described the fact that actually when we look at, at the data, class is a much more significant indicator in relation to life outcomes. But this kind of obsession with race actually obscures that very important and relevant conversation. So I think that the, the conversation about race is hugely weaponized. I think, you know, in the, in the UK very recently, we had this controversy of, um, you know, the, the, the BBC proms trying to get rid of some of the uh, famous uh, national songs and it's being done in the name of kind of anti-racism and oftentimes you know yeah this is very much weaponized in order to push forward a particular ideological agenda and re-educate the public into what is supposedly the right way of thinking. Well, I often suspect that a lot of the things that have happened in the wake of Black Lives Matter, particularly the more kind of outlandish ones in relation to culture, are things that a lot of particularly kind of upper middle class establishment type people wanted to do anyway, <laughs> and have just uh, happened to have this opportunity to, you know, now they can do what they want and demonstrate how good they are and their solidarity with the black community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Camille, your thoughts on this? It's interesting. And at the risk of sounding too conspiratorial, I mean, yeah. I mean, the reason why race is at the forefront of this effort is because it is an effective tool. It, it works exceptionally well. It's great for shutting the, the people up who happen to have the wrong attributes for being able to put them on defensive footing, no matter what they say. Ideas like institutional racism, for example, which sound authoritative, but are, are really amorphous, like kind of rhetorical traps. Um, racism itself, in, especially in the way that it's been constructed now, which can mean virtually anything, essentially means whatever I say it does on account of my appearance. Like these are really effective tools. And it is hard, uh, not only hard to defend yourself from, but in a circumstance where you actually have all of this historically significant stuff that's happened that creates this tremendous amount of emotional baggage. It can be really, really hard for people to even imagine themselves speaking out against this stuff because they want to be on the right side of history. And it's the reason why so much of the conversation seems to be do the work, 
there's so much that I need to learn. Mm. There's so many things that I need to be exposed to. I have to find someone who can explain this to me. I mean, for someone who is actually interested in achieving some sort of political end, I mean, what, what could be more effective than that? And finally, just to wrap up, I'd like to hear from each of you, how do we fight back against this? How do we put what I would call proper anti-racism back on the table? How do we how do we transcend race? What are the killer arguments or what are the key priorities? Inaya, let's go to you first. The immediate priority is ensuring that this conversation is mainstream. Unfortunately, like this is still very much a fringe conversation. Anytime race is, you know, brought to the fore, you know, the, the immediate conversation is about race as a very fixed and reified and institutionalized category that define every aspect of our existence. And I think that we have to rigorously challenge that starting point. And so I think making sure and ensuring that this conversation it is a, a mainstream starting point and, and putting both racist and anti racist in the kind of modern conception, at least on the back foot, definitely the most recent manifestation have very uh, unfortunate and, and, and significant overlaps. Obviously, they come from different motivations, they would argue, but the notion that, you know, your race is the most important characteristic about you that it should uh, and does define your access to material resources and and your ideas and political views and, and who you should even date. That is, you know, at the core, a very racist notion. And I think that we really have to be much more forthright in calling it out or these ideologues essentially will, will have the moral high ground. So I think that, yeah, mainstreaming this conversation, consistently arguing against instilling race with any meaning positive or, or negative and, and forging an ideal beyond this moment, not just critiquing it, being part of um, trying to create a a meaningful alternative. Camille, your final words. No, that sounds that sounds great to me. And my very good friend, Thomas Chatterton Williams, who I'm sure won't be a stranger to, to many people listening, once said to me that you can't be anti-racist without being anti-race. And I think that that is <laughs> extremely sound advice. I think it's very important that we find ways to, in conversation, complicate narratives um, around a lot of the things that people imagine race explains in very neat and tidy ways. And that does require us to try to have conversations in public. And it does mean being uncomfortable and being willing to take a bit of a risk when articulating perspectives, even talking about things that it seems are, are very settled at this point. I think that's probably the most effective way to have this conversation. I think the general approach uh, that anti-racists have used recently is to insist on people sort of swearing fealty to their cause <laughs> um, openly, telling people that they can't be silent if they're silent, that this is somehow an expression of their disloyalty. And essentially, by so doing, trying to make it impossible for other perspectives to actually exist on the same sort of terrain as them. And uh, I think you just, one has to push back against that and point out just how destructive and antithetical to the values of a free and open society and to ideals like free speech, all of those practices are. And I think it's, it's totally doable, but you actually have to show up and you actually have to be willing to try to have the conversation. And it can't be limited to people who have the right phenotypic traits being the ones who are making these arguments. Everyone can say the things that I've said today because they are true um, and they can be supported in a rigorous philosophical way. You've been listening to The Spiked Podcast. For more Spike content, don't forget to keep visiting us at spiked-online.com, where you can also make a donation or treat yourself to something from our shop.